the last. Sixteen now, Psalm books five six zero. Is thy heart right with God? Think about the words as we sing it this morning. As we sing out five six zero, is thy heart right with God? Is your heart right with God this morning? Let's sing it out. Have thine affections been nailed to the cross? Is thy heart right with God? thing I want to do, I normally don't uh, recognize birthdays, and so if I forget yours, uh, do not hold it against me because it's not something that I normally do. But I did want to mention um, Mrs. Glover, who tomorrow is going to celebrate 92 years, 92 years. And so happy birthday to you, 92 years. 
and then people less than half their age can't make it to church. Ouch! 92 years old, praise the Lord uh, for you and happy birthday to you. We want to welcome everyone out this morning to Cornerstone Baptist Church, especially our visitors. And if you are a visitor here in church today, we won't ask that you say or do anything, but we would like to uh, recognize you as being a visitor by giving you a visitor's card. So if this is your first time at our church, if you would just slip your hand up, the ushers will file through. They'll give you a visitor's card as well as a pen to fill it out with. You'll also be receiving a gift from our church today. And so make sure before you leave today, you stop by the welcome desk in the back, uh, see one of the ushers and make sure you get your gift. They'll try to catch you with it, uh, but don't leave without that special gift from Cornerstone Baptist Church. We're excited to have you here today and just wanna welcome you to the house of the Lord and um, invite you to listen as God's word is preached. We're currently in a sermon series, the book of First Peter, and we're preaching verse by verse, line by line through the book of First Peter. We started chapter two today, and the title of the series is From Panic to Peace. And in Sunday school, we looked at the fact that you can't do that without cream. And if you weren't in Sunday school, you don't know what that means. Uh, but if you were here for adult Sunday school, you know exactly what that means. You cannot go from panic to peace without cream. The new members class will begin after this service is over. If you're here and you've been saved, you're not yet a member of Cornerstone Baptist Church, but you're interested in membership, uh, please see me. We will have a brief 15-minute, uh, basically introductory uh, lesson today for those who wish to join Cornerstone Baptist Church. And then we're going to meet back here for the evening service at 5 o'clock. Uh, you are welcome to come back for our evening service. It is a completely different message than the morning. And uh, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, adult Sunday school, it's all different lessons. And it's really geared for a different emphasis each service. And so get the whole pie, come back out for the evening service tonight. The children's choir will practice tonight. We will have our men's meeting and also a meeting for ladies uh, regarding the mother-daughter banquet coming up this Friday night. Wednesday Bible study and prayer time at 7. Uh, last week of our spring soul winning campaign as far as the bus ministry, the bus push. And uh, we've gotten lots of new contacts for the bus ministry. And when you pray for that bus ministry, remember to pray for the captains as they work with those young people and, 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 and give them the gospel and try to see them saved as well as their their parents come to Christ. Pray for the bus ministry. And then pray for the discipleship ministry, those that are uh, new to Christ, that are babes in the Lord as they're being worked with uh, by various members of our church. Pray that those members will be faithful and that those uh, new babes in Christ would also be faithful uh, to their discipleship. Okay. Uh, ladies, soul winning Tuesday at 315. Again, that is a ministry and those that have committed to it, if, it's, if, if there's a problem that hinders you from it, please let me know. But we're expecting that on Tuesday at 315 in the afternoon. See me for some visits and then we will get you on your way. Saturday, men's prayer at 9 o'clock, bus and soul winning. As far as the academy, do be praying for our candy sale. Uh, we are. We went from zero to twelve thousand uh, dollars in candy credit uh, just this past week. So God has greatly blessed our sale. We've got one more week at it, and then the kids are back in school. That is essentially their spring break, and it is a, a fundraiser for the school. We purchased about seven thousand dollars worth of candy, and the goal is to sell that to pay that back. Of course, as an expense but then to make a profit that we can use for the academy, for the school. And so be praying for that. If we uh, hit $20,000 in credit, uh, then of course that gives us $13,000 to use for building projects and uh, academy materials and, and all of that once we pay back the candy. And if you haven't bought candy from us yet, um, essentially every box, uh, they're $9 boxes, when we sell a box, $4, goes to the candy company, $5 goes to the academy. So we make uh, a 
little bit better than 50% on each box that we sell. Just a reminder. Um, also, if you could help us with the pews, keeping them nice and clean, uh, keeping uh, track especially of the children and not leaving any trash behind, making sure the books are back in the book holders when we're done. Call the glory for the month of May. Are they in? They are in. If you need that devotional, they are $1 a piece. If you have a cell phone, please power it off at this time so that we don't have that as a distraction when the preaching of God, God's word begins. If you could please silence any cell phones. Also, when we have uh, special music, uh, like from our choir or even uh, solo selections, I know it is customary to give a round of applause when that is done. Um, our church is a little different in that we see it as worship and part of our worship and as being something done unto God to prepare our hearts for the preaching. So not a performance, not entertainment, but rather part of our worship. And so when we do hear special music, rather than applause, if God blesses your heart by it, a hearty amen is much more appropriate than a round of applause. And then uh, be praying about our mini Bible college modules with Dr. Cloud starting up again on June the 19th through July 1st, he'll be coming back and going through uh, my favorite book of the Bible, which is the book of Acts. I believe those modules have been very good for our church. I believe uh, that we're even now starting to see some of the results, people taking their Bible study more serious and also their evangelism more serious, uh, us seeing things in our church being dealt with that have really just been uh, let go for a long time, things that needed to be strengthened. And so I'm thankful for those modules and be faithful to them when they start back up again. Okay, this Friday night is for you ladies. Uh, it is a, a banquet, a meal, a delicious meal for all of you ladies. It is a mother-daughter banquet. It's not a mother and daughter banquet. It's fine if you're a mother and you bring your daughter, but it is designed for anyone that is a mother or daughter. And we will have a uh, guest speaker uh, that will be speaking that night on Friday. It will start at 6.30 p.m. with the meal. And then the guest speaker will be speaking right after the meal is over. Cost is only ten dollars uh, per plate and uh, you can turn that in today. That would help us actually with being able to purchase uh, the items for the banquet. Uh, but ten dollars per plate for that and then be praying for the guest speaker uh, Mrs. Beth Burns. I'm not going to give you her whole story but she's a devoted Christian mother uh, and a devoted Christian church member. And a few years ago, her husband passed away suddenly on a Saturday morning um, after uh, going to men's prayer at their church and then coming home and cooking a meal for his family. He had some, some, some pains and uh, went, went in for that and didn't come home and left her with eight children. And uh, through that, she was faithful to the Lord and has a testimony for every woman in this room and the visitors that I'm asking you to bring on a Friday night. And so if you are hurting, particularly if you know someone, another lady that's hurting and could use some real encouragement from somebody that's been through, then, then the last thing you want to do is miss Friday night. So you come on out and you call off whatever you have to do to get here on Friday night and bring some ladies with you that can be encouraged. I've asked her to do two things. I've asked her to give the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ for those that may be here and not saved. And then secondly, I've asked her to go through the experience of losing her husband and how the Lord has strengthened her through it. Okay, ushers, if you'll make your way forward. The very biggest day on our church calendar is June 5th. On that day, we'll celebrate our 14th anniversary. And um, the, the pastor, the former pastor of Fairhaven Baptist Church, Pastor Roger Vogelin, will be preaching uh, that service will be preaching salvation in the morning and uh, we'll be giving away 100 bicycles that day for the community and asking you to bring out visitors to hear the gospel that day that is Sunday June 5th amazing how quickly it's coming but let's be in prayer for that special special gospel emphasis day brother Brown if you would come and pray for our offering as we receive it Let's pray. Lord, we are thankful that you are so good to us, oh God. 
Lord, even through trials, Lord, you are still good. You're merciful, you're true. And Lord, we, we just thank you that you decide fit, Lord, to take care of us as a church and as a people. Lord, you bless us with so much, Lord. Even when we think we don't have a lot, Lord, just look at other places around the world of people that are hurting, Lord. And we think we're in pain, Lord. There's someone else, Lord, that experienced it far greater pain than we are, Lord. So it's up to us to be thankful, oh God, for all you've done, for how good you've been. Lord, we are thankful that we have a church, Lord, that we can come and just hear from you, Lord. Lord, it's all in vain if we don't take something away from this service, Lord, right. that is from your Bible, Lord, that we can live out the rest of our life. Lord, I pray now, Lord, as we do our part in this part of the service, Lord, help us to be cheerful, give us to your work, that we want to see your work go forward in this community, that lives may be changed, that those around us may hear the gospel, that they may know that there is a chance at heaven, Lord, all because we did our part, Lord, and to give on to your work. So I pray, oh God, that we see this as a time to jump in, Lord, and not to hold back from you, that you've been too good to us, Lord, to even imagine to not give to you. So Lord, I just thank you for all you've done. Thank you for being good. Thank you for your word that is going to be preached, Lord. And I ask you all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. continue singing this morning, 801, 801, how great thou art, let's think about the oh, goodness of our God as we sing, how great thou art, and as we sing this song, I'll ask that the ladies sing verse 2 when we get there, and then the men sing out on verse 3 of 801, how great thou art, so the ladies will sing the verse on 2, the men will join in on the chorus, then when we get to 3, the men will sing the verse, and the ladies join in on the chorus. 801.
Stand with me as we sing our final song for the morning. 541, which is only trust him. Only trust him now because he can save you. He alone can save you. Amen? There is no other way. Only Jesus can save you. 541, only trust him now. sing the final verse. Let's take some time and greet those around us.
As we make our way back to our seats, we'll stand in our place and sing 541 as we stand. Make our way back to our seats. 541, let's stand in our place and sing verse number three. Yes, Jesus is the truth, the way that leads you into rest. Believe in him without delay, and you are fully blessed. Only trust him, only trust him, only trust him now. Maybe seated. take our Bibles and go to the book of 1st Peter 1st Peter chapter 2 1st Peter chapter 2 
in our sermon series entitled From Panic to Peace. We've looked at From Panic to Peace Chosen, From Panic to Peace Confident, From Panic to Peace Called, From Panic to Peace counter, counter plan, From Panic to Peace Canon, From Panic to Peace Cream. And this morning, we're going to look at From Panic to Peace Cornerstone. From Panic to Peace Cornerstone. First Peter chapter 2, make sure you turn there in your Bibles, follow along with us if at all possible. First Peter chapter 2, from panic to peace, cornerstone. And I'll give you time to get there, but do get there. First Peter chapter 2, verse number 4. First Peter chapter 2, verse number 4. By the way, you're about to hear this morning why we named this church Cornerstone Baptist Church. From panic to peace, Cornerstone. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2. If you'll stand with me for the reading of the text, we'll pray and then you can take your seat. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 4. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. Do you see that? A chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. That cornerstone is the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 7, unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient whereunto also they were appointed heavenly father i pray that you would help us through the book of first peter i ask for your help as i preach your power your wisdom your holy spirit to guide and that your son would be clearly seen through the message. I pray that the gospel would be right at the forefront. I pray that you would be glorified. I, it's hard for me to emphasize this morning how much I need you, Heavenly Father, to preach your word. And also every listener, how much they need you to hear the message you have for them today. I pray that you would bless us all. Bless your people. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Hey, let's make sure that we are very much paying attention to God's word as it's being preached. I would encourage you to have a pen handy and really, really seek to learn. I know the devil, he wants the word to be preached and for you to be distracted. And so let's, let's watch out for things that will distract us from the word of God today. And I'll help with that. I'll help watch for distractions. Peter, in the passage that we just read, describes the church as a spiritual house. Now you're looking at walls that are physical walls, but this isn't the church. You understand the building's not the church. When we were meeting at the Hyde Park Neighborhood Club, we were meeting as a church. The church isn't the building. 
The church is the body of baptized believers. And that is a building in Christ that he builds with, watch me now, living stones. Very important. This passage is connected with the previous one about spiritual growth. We looked at that in Sunday school as newborn babes, Malachi, desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. It is by tasting Christ in verse number 3, chapter 2, verse 3. It is by tasting him and coming to him in verse number 4 that one can understand their position in Christ. If you're saved, you have a position in Christ. You are a holy priest, a royal priesthood. A holy priesthood is yours. If you're saved, you are a part of a holy nation. If you're saved, you are part of a peculiar people. By the way, those are terms that were originally used in the law of Moses, terms for Israel. They were to be that nation. They were to be that peculiar people. That's detailed in Deuteronomy 28. Israel though went in the judgment, and it's as if God put Israel on a shelf for a little bit of time. He's turned his attention from Israel to the church, but Israel will one day be redeemed and restored to the place of God's blessing at Christ's return. And then Israel will be that priesthood that God designed her to be. After Jesus was rejected by Israel, and they had that plot to kill Christ, the leaders plotted to put him to death. It was after that plot that Jesus said, I'll build my church. Now don't miss that. Pinch yourself. Harold, you with me? Okay, I'm naming names today. Okay, last week was Easter, we had visitors, so I was nice. I was nice. And uh, I didn't didn't wake any snoozers up, but today I am. I'm going to call you right by name. Say, wake up. Okay? But it was after that plot to kill Christ that Jesus said, I'll build my church. Don't miss that. He was rejected by the Jews, and then he said, I'll build my church. And for 2,000 years, that's exactly what he's been doing. He's been building his church, taking out a people for himself from the Gentile nations. And that's you and I, his church. And so today, the church is God's house. If I could get a little bit of monitor, I know you can hear me well, but if I don't hear myself well, then I'll be even louder, and then I won't have a voice to preach tonight. So today, the church is God's house. The church is God's nation. The church is God's people. And again, that doesn't mean that God is is done with Israel. Paul plainly states that God covenants, God's covenants with Israel will be fulfilled. We see the chief cornerstone of the spiritual house. A little bit of monitor, a little bit more. Thank you. The chief cornerstone, that's perfect. The chief cornerstone of the spiritual house house is Christ. He is the cornerstone. Don't miss that. Why was this church named Cornerstone Baptist Church? Because Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. And your life will stay in a panic state without Jesus Christ. Doesn't that make sense? He is called in the Bible the Prince of Peace. You'll stay panicked without Christ. We need him. We need him to be the rock and the cornerstone of our lives. You can't go from panic to peace without Jesus. You need him. Now that's everyone in this room. Sometimes I'll say something like that and people will think, oh, he's talking to visitors or somebody that might not be saved. No, I'm talking to every single solitary person in this room. You need Christ. 
to be the cornerstone of your life. God always begins with Christ. He is the chief cornerstone of the house. There's a story told about Michelangelo, the great sculptor, and he came across a thrown out piece of, of marble, and they were going to discard it. It had been ruined by some other sculptor, but it still bore the marks of, of that person's mess up, that, merc that person's incompetence. And that piece of marble lay there rejected. That piece of marble lay there ruined and unwanted just in a yard. Michelangelo looked at that messed up piece of marble and he didn't see a messed up piece of marble. He saw David. And if you look at one of his famous sculptures, David, you'll know that that came from a messed up piece of marble that he was able to turn into a masterpiece. The world, many people in the world, Jesus was rejected by the world. They saw him as just a, 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 a messed up piece. But God said, no, this is my cornerstone. My cornerstone. And so Jesus Christ is the head of the body. The pastor is not the head of the church. He's an under-shepherd, but the head of the church is Christ, the cornerstone. What security we have today in Jesus Christ. He is the chosen one. And a person has eternal citizenship in that holy nation through Christ. By the way, Christ is an eternal citizen of that holy city. And you are safe in the house if you've been purchased by Christ's blood. Established on Christ as the chief cornerstone. Built on Christ. That's where I want my life to be. That's where I want my wife to be. That's where I want my children to be. Not built up on what this world has, but built on the cornerstone. Jesus told the, 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 the parable of the man that would build his house on the sand. So many people have built their lives on sinking sand. And I want my life built upon the rock, the cornerstone. According to verse number four, he is elect, chosen, royal, peculiar, and shall not be confounded. Christ is, according to verse number four, a living stone. Christ is often described by that metaphor, stone. He's the cornerstone of this church. As I was thinking about names and praying over names and, and even getting some feedback from my spiritual leadership on a fitting name for this church, the Lord brought this name to my mind. Cornerstone. He is the cornerstone of the church. He's the foundation stone. He is to be the rock and refuge of those who call this church their home. He is the rock of strength. He is the rock from which flows the finest of the wheat and honey. According to verse 4 and 7, Christ is disallowed. You'll see that in your Bible. Disallowed, what does that mean? Rejected. Christ was emphatically rejected by Israel's leaders. Jesus was rejected by Israel as a nation. And Jesus Christ is still disallowed today. Jesus Christ is rejected. The people said that Jesus was demon-possessed. Keep your place here in 1 Peter, but go with me to John chapter 7. John chapter 7. The people said that Jesus Christ was demon-possessed and that he did his miracles by the works of the devil. John chapter 7, verse 19. John chapter 7, verse 19. John 7, 19. What's the first word in verse number 19, Dominique? Did. 
Look at that verse. Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keepeth the law? Jesus is speaking here. He says, why go ye about to kill me? The people answered and said, thou hast a devil. Who goeth about to kill thee? They said that Jesus was demon-possessed. Go to Matthew chapter 12. This is what they said about the Lord Jesus. Matthew chapter 12. Verse number 24. Matthew chapter 12. Verse number 24. Scripture. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. They said he's casting out devils by the power of the devil. He was disallowed. These so-called builders in Israel were looking for a, a political leader to lead them out from the rule of Rome. They wanted a king, but they did not want a savior. That is the world we live in right now. The world we live in right now wants a political king, someone that will be smooth and, and someone that will be agreeable and someone that will mix well and, and give them all of the benefits that the government has to offer. This world wants an Obama, but they don't want Jesus. They want a king, but not a savior. Jesus is just as disallowed in 2022 as he was 2,000 years ago. The leaders of the people called for Jesus' crucifixion. Remember that? Crucify him. Crucify him. And since then, he's been rejected by the vast majority of men in every century. But when we go back to 1 Peter, go back there. This one that is rejected of men is chosen of God. Verse number 4. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 4. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God. Rejected by men, but chosen of God. He is God's chosen one. He is God's anointed one. That's the meaning of Christ in the Greek. Chosen, anointed of God. That's the meaning of Messiah in the Hebrew. The Father chose the Son. He chose Him to be incarnated in the last Adam. He chose the Son to be the Savior, the Lord, the Head, the King. I want to say something about Jesus today that the world won't say. He is precious. He is precious. Look at verse number four. To whom coming as unto a living stone disallowed indeed of men. But look at verse number seven. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious. Precious is the Greek word in timos meaning estimable. Dear, costly, valuable. He is the valuable one. The unspeakably valuable one. Not just valuable, but unspeakably valuable. And through him we are accepted in the beloved. Apart from Christ, you are nothing. Apart from Christ, you have nothing. Apart from Christ, you can do nothing. For in him we move and have our being. He is the chief cornerstone. Peter emphasizes this. The word chief is not in that prophecy, but we see it in Ephesians. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Keep your place now in 1 Peter. Ephesians chapter 2. This church isn't about self-help or psychology or even a motivational speech. This isn't a pep rally. This church is about Jesus Christ and him crucified. And that's the way it'll stay as long as I'm here. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Underneath the logo of this church is this verse. Ephesians 2, verse number 20. Ephesians 2, 20. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles 
and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now it's important for you to understand what a cornerstone is. A cornerstone in modern architecture is really just a symbolic thing, a stone that's put in place to commemorate the building of whatever building is about to go up. And many times in that cornerstone will be inscribed the date that that building uh, was dedicated or, or reared up, and, and that has a nickname, if you will, the cornerstone. But in architecture, a cornerstone isn't just nomenclature. The cornerstone, uh, especially in ancient building, was the first stone that was laid in the ground for that building, not to commemorate it, not as a memorial, but that stone would be the basis upon which every other stone would be placed. It would mark the lines. It would mark the structure. And that cornerstone would keep all of the other stones in its proper place because they would be laid according to that stone. So that stone. And if that stone was messed up, everything else in that building would be messed up. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. And if you don't have him, you're messed up. The chief cornerstone, beautiful wording in the word of God. The cornerstone of a building establishes the lines and the angles. The cornerstone of a building carries the weight of that building. Aren't you glad that Jesus Christ is our chief cornerstone? The cornerstone of the church is the son of God. Perfect in strength, perfect in wisdom, perfect in beauty, perfect in might. In contrast, the unbeliever's life is built on sand. Sinking sand. Christ is laid by God in verse number 6. Go back to 1 Peter. Who laid this stone? 1 Peter 2, 6. What's the first word in verse number 6? Tamika. Wherefore? Also, it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion. Zion is another word for Jerusalem. I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. This stone is laid by God. Christ was rejected by Israel at his first coming. He's been rejected by Jews, been rejected by people for 2,000 years. He's going to be rejected by another generation when the Antichrist takes the scene. But he cannot be stopped. Rejected every... Remember, Herod tried to destroy him as a child. But the cornerstone can't be stopped. Remember, they wanted to throw him in Nazareth off the, the brow of the hill. But the chief cornerstone can't be stopped. Remember, they wanted to defeat him on Calvary's cross. And they thought they had the chief cornerstone finally conquered. But he can't be stopped. You can't stop the chief cornerstone. Christ is elect according to verse number six. It says there, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone elect. He is God's chosen. He is God's anointed. He's God's man. Jamal, I need you to sit up. Yes, sir. Amen. He is God's man. Christ is the one on whom we believe. The Bible says, he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Do you see that in verse number six? He that believeth on him shall not be confounded. I don't want to be confounded. That word confounded is the Greek katashuno, meaning to shame, to disgrace. A sinner who puts his trust 100% in the Lord Jesus Christ will never be put spiritually to shame and disgrace as far as their standing is concerned, their salvation is concerned. If you believe on him, you can't be confounded. The unbeliever is going to be confounded. The unbeliever is going to be put to eternal shame. The unbeliever is going to be put to eternal disgrace, but not the believer Christ is precious to the believer. 
according to verse number 7. Three times in chapter 2, verses 4 through 7, Christ is called precious. Christ is precious to God. He's precious to the believer. We know he's precious to the angels. The angels came to worship him at his birth. And he ought to be precious to us as believers, his creatures. Again, it's their Greek word, entomos, which means highly esteemed, valuable, dear. Is that Jesus to you? It is used for the centurion servant that was dear to him. Same word. If you've been in Sunday school, you, you remember that, that healing, the centurion servant that was dear to him. That's Jesus Christ, his value. It's not just valuable and dear. It's inestimably valuable and unspeakably valuable. Dear, without him, you have no part in God. You have no part in salvation. Without Jesus, all you have to look forward to is eternal judgment in hell. That's your future without this one that is precious. He's also a stone of stumbling, according to verse number 8. Don't miss that. Verse 8, and a stone of stumbling. He's a rock of offense in verse number eight. Peter here describes the judgment of those who are disobedient to Christ by rejecting the gospel. Rejecting Christ in the minds of people is just, oh, stumbling over a little stone. It's just stumbling over a little stone. But in reality, because you've bypass that stone, that stone is going to become the object of your judgment and you're thinking you're stumbling over all oh, that stuff about Jesus. It's cute for kids. It's not, I don't, it's no big deal. Oh, the, it's just a little stumbling. People walk past when I'm street preaching, they hear me preach about Christ. Oh, they, they're stum I'm just stumbling over a little stone. Maybe that's something, but ah, nah, nah, nah. They don't understand that that very stone is actually a rock that's going to crush them in judgment. A stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. A rock of offense. When someone rejects Christ, they think they're tripping over a stone. But really, they're just setting themselves up to be eternally crushed by God's perfect justice. The word offense, look there with me at verse number 8. A stone of stumbling and a rock of offense offense. That is the Greek word scandalon, which means a trap. We get our English word scandal from that, that word offense. A scandalon is a, is a trap. A bait is on that trap. Okay, you think of uh, the, the little mouse traps. Okay, you take that trap and you pull it back. Uh, coming from the projects, I'm very, very familiar with that. You take that, that trap, you, you pull it back, you put that little you know, that little stick in place, and, and then it's ready. Okay, put your cheese on it first, right? Because it's ready. That is the, the, the word here, offense, a trap. They didn't agree with Christ. They didn't accept him. To them, they had their own plan. They were rejecting him as their rock. They were rejecting him. But the judgment's still there as a trap ready for them, those that have rejected him. A trap. If you're here today and you're without Christ, that, that same rock that, that wants to be the rock of your salvation will also be the object of your judgment. Think about that. He can be your foundation. He can be everything you build your life upon and you can have unbelievable stability in life through that rock or you can let that rock fall on you. We see the living stones and they are the occupants of this spiritual house. We see that in verses 4 through 10. And after leaving the cornerstone of the house, we turn our attention to the redeemed who are the living stones. If you're here and you're saved, you're, you're, you're a member of our church, you are a living stone in this house. And you're called to minister 
in the house. What a high calling. What a high calling. I answered the call to preach. There's nothing else I could do in this life and be satisfied. If God has called a man to preach, why stoop to be a king? There's nothing else I would rather do than stand and preach and teach the word of God. It is a high calling. But if you're a saved person, you too have a high calling, a very high calling. You are a living stone. Without Christ, the sinner has no relationship with God in the spiritual house. But through Christ, you have not only a relationship, but a position You've been lifted into the heavenlies, and you have not just grace to make it into heaven, but an opportunity to serve in God's kingdom. What a privilege this is. All of this is obtained by coming to Christ. How does that happen? Coming to Christ, verse number four. To whom coming? When you come to him through grace, by faith through grace, when you come to him, he gives you a position in this house. And then the church is built up in verse number five. Do you see that? Ye also as lively stones. Ye also. That's talking about you, the church. As lively stones are built up a spiritual house. Churches are built. They don't just happen. Uh, churches don't just evolve. Okay? They don't just come out of anywhere. They are built the house is built by God. It is God's plan. It is God's program. It is God's business. He's right in the middle of that business. And I've been thankful many, many, many times that he's been right there in the middle of the business. It's built by him. The house is also built by men. Paul called himself a wise master builder. He describes believers as builders. If you're a saved member of this church, then you are to be a builder up of this church. How are you doing that? In what ways are you building up the church? It's like a physical house. The spiritual house is built by a blueprint or a design. If everybody here that lives in a building, which is all of us, some, at some point a blueprint was made so that that house or that apartment building could be built right. Without a blueprint, you can't have the right type of building. Well, the blueprint for the church is this book that I'm holding. This is the blueprint. We don't run this church the way you want it to run. I don't care who you are, and I don't care how much you put in the plate. We don't run this church by the way you think it ought to run. We don't run this church by the way I think it ought to run. Now, there is authority with a pastor, and there are decisions that he can make, but not and go against this book. Not at all. This is the blueprint. Okay? So don't say, I don't like that about the church. Ask, first of all, is it in accordance with the blueprint? And if it is, then get with the program. The word house is in the Greek oikos, which refers to a building or a dwelling. This is referred to by Paul in the book of Ephesians. We read it already. I'll just read it and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together, groweth up unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. The local church is the house of God for this present age. This place right here. And every New Testament church is to reflect the exact character that God's spiritual house should reflect. We should be a reflection of God's character. That's why we've got to be careful about our testimony in the building and outside of the building. Because we're reflecting his glory. That means we have to have saved members. We, we have to have not just saved members, but ministering members. If you're just warming the pew as a member, you're, 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 you're not doing what you ought to do as far as the blueprint of God's house to build it up. The local church is a spiritual house. 
It's a holy priesthood. It is nothing less. We see that in the first church. All of the members of the first church in Acts had a clear testimony of salvation. They were saved and they knew it. They were present when the word was preached. They were faithful, active members according to Acts 2, 41 and 42. A church that has members that are nowhere to be found. A church that has members that are not active in service is not a New Testament church after the order of the Bible. It's not just that you are a member. It's where are you at? And what are you doing? The apostolic churches had big problems, but they were confronted. Case in point, 1 Corinthians. All kinds of problems at the church at Corinth. Problems, wake up, Jamal, wake up. All kinds of problems at Corinth. What kind of problems? Immorality, marital problems, all kinds of problems. Doctrinal problems, problems with tongues, problems with a lack of love, big problems. How did the Apostle Paul come at it? Directly, unequivocally, with zeal, he went right at the air. In a church that has problems, like all churches do, and where the leadership doesn't go right after the problem, is a church that is in error. A church that's not going in the direction God would have it to go. So, yeah, we have problems, but we're not going to be comfortable with those problems. We're not going to be comfortable with those problems. We're going to zealously confront them. So we're not going to be that carnal church, that lukewarm church where everything goes. Man, you're going to be in the hallway and tell somebody off, and they just have to take it. That was the old cornerstone. That was the cornerstone of a month ago, where you could just pop off at the mouth, and they just had to take it. No, 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 no. No, no, you're going to be confronted and sternly rebuked, sharply. Why? That you may be sound in the faith. That's scripture. The members are to be living stones. The word lively in verse number five is the same as living in verse number four. We see that each stone of the building is living. A natural stone is a dead thing. Um, if you see any stones that are alive, run. <laughs> uh, run real fast. It can be beautiful, but guess what? It's dead. It can be colorful, but guess what? It's dead. It can be interestingly shaped, but it's dead. There is nothing man can do to make a stone alive, but God can. We're born into this world dead stones. Who can make that stone live? It's like the, the, the dead bones in Ezekiel. Who can make it live? Only God can. This is what is described as being born again in chapter 1, verse 3. Quickened from the dead. You have to be supernaturally saved before you can be a living stone. And my hope and prayer is that if there are any dead stones in our congregation today, that you be made alive through Christ. Now, a stone is definitely identifiable. Don't you think that you'd recognize a dead stone from a living one? Don't you think you should be recognized as a, as a living stone instead of a dead one? In other words, don't you think there ought to be proof that you're saved? Hmm? The Bible says that salvation has evidence. Go with me to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, salvation has evidence. It should be, I used to smoke weed. It should be, I used to smoke. Salvation has evidence. John chapter 10, you'll follow him, not the ways of the world. John chapter 10, verse 27, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, 
and I know them, and they follow me. How do you know if you're saved? How do you know if you're a sheep? You're following the shepherd. If you're not following the shepherd, then you're not one of the sheep, because his sheep hear his voice. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now let's make it more personal and of the heart. It should be, I used to lie all the time. I used to lie all the time. I used to get envious and jealous and talk about people. Uh Uh-oh. Now, Pastor Lewis, you're meddling. That's the preacher's business. That's my business, to meddle. Take God's word and meddle. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 17. It says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. The fornication's gone. The adultery's gone. The pornography's gone. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. A living stone shows. Man, if a stone just came running through the auditorium this morning, we'd recognize that from a dead stone. You ought to be recognizable from a dead stone. Look at 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. First John chapter 2, verse 4. First John chapter 2, verse number 4. Lois, what's the first word in verse number 4? He. First John 2, 4. I don't think it's over because Lois said it. I might ask you to say, what, what's the fourth word in that verse? Okay, so you get there. 1 John chapter 2, verse number 4. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. Oh, there's not evidence of salvation? There ought to be evidence. We see that a living stone has a purpose in God's house. Every stone has been created for a purpose. Now, don't miss this. Living stones. Outside of this building are bricks. Okay, you look at, there are different types and styles of bricks on different buildings. Different bricks for different purposes. Okay, your brick is to have an important part in this building, but your brick isn't supposed to be like sister so-and-so's brick. And brother so-and-so's brick is his brick. God put him as a living stone in this building, but Brother so-and-so shouldn't get envious because they don't have the spot that brother so-and-so's got. God puts the bricks in the building right where he, it's his building. Let him build it the way he wants to build it. Well, if I can't do that, then I'm not doing nothing. So what that means is if one of the captains of the, of the ladies' teams is trying to help and get ladies out, For the mother-daughter banquet, what we're thinking about is not our pride, but heaven and hell. Where are you at? Where does God want you to be in this spiritual house? The believer doesn't choose his calling. You surrender to God's calling. And you seek to prove the perfect will of God by growing and ministering. Every born-again believer is a living stone, and it's a privilege and an opportunity to surrender to that reality and say, I'll just be your living stone. Put me in the building where you want me to be. And I'll be content to be exactly that stone that you want me to be in God's house. I'll be that stone. I won't try to be another. Christ, the cornerstone. It's only through him that you're going to find peace. You will live in panic when you've got your eyes on other people. You will live in panic when you've got your eyes on your circumstances. But when you, listen, you will live in panic when you start saying, why does she have a boyfriend and I don't? Oh, now you're really meddling, Pastor Lewis. You're going to live your life in panic. Put your eyes on Christ, the cornerstone. and He'll conduct you from panic to peace. Heads bowed. Eyes closed. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us. Help us to be your living stones. 
Help us, Lord, to be found faithful in building up this spiritual house unto you. I pray that if there's someone here today, they've been building their, their life on sinking sand, lost and without you. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would speak to their heart even now and show them that instead of sand, they can have a rock, that rock being Christ. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to depend upon our cornerstone, to rest upon him. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand quietly to your feet with your heads bowed, eyes closed. Don't grab your keys. Thank you for viewing our live stream service today. We want to let you know that our service doesn't end with the conclusion of